Welcome to the Catapult Lockdown Virtual Salon. This afternoon, I'll be in discussion with Lisanne Godesai Charles. My name is Andre Bagu. I've been enjoying these virtual salons, which have allowed all of us to cross borders during a time of closed borders. And for this, I'm eternally grateful to Catapult partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk. I'm really looking forward to talking today to Lisanne. Lisanne is a native of the Dutch Caribbean islands of Saba and St. Martin, and has been writing poetry, short stories, and songs, including calypsos, for the past 30 years. In 2016, four years ago, she wrote the winning calypso for St. Martin's first ever female monarch. During the course of our conversation, please feel free to ask your questions in the comments section during our discussion. We'll try to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, and please also remember to subscribe to the Fresh Milk YouTube channel and social media platform pages. So now without further ado, let's welcome Lisanne. Hi, Andre, it's uh, great to be oh. here. And I wanna just go ahead and uh, also uh, reiterate the thank you that you gave to the four organizations uh, for making this happen. It, for making this happen and for connecting creatives across the Caribbean during this time. So um, yes, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to have this conversation with you. Oh, wonderful, likewise. So um, in the spirit of a true literary salon, I understand that you're gonna to begin today's proceedings with a poem. Yes, I am, I am. I'm gonna read actually from my book, uh, which I self-published last year called uh, Here or Her, depending on the interpretation of the reader. And um, actually, I'm going to read a poem that is very dear to my heart. It's called I Want to Tell You. Um, and it goes like this. I want to tell you. I want to tell you that you should not be afraid of rainbows. I'm sorry, Andre. I actually have to. I'm sorry. I have to go back. What I actually want to read is a poem called What the Elders Did Not Tell You. And later on, I'm going to read the other poem. So this you poem can read actually, whatever you want to read. Great, thank you. But actually, I actually <laughs> want to start with this one because I want to talk about how I actually got inspired by, uh, you know, to be in arts later on. So I'm going to start with this one. It's called What the Elders Did Not Tell You. What the elders did not tell you, so you could not tell us, so we did not know. We now know and tell to those who come behind us. Though they seem to need no notice, they already know this, already live this, it appears. But just so that we do not return to fear, let it be put out there, stated clear, that it is okay to be free, that who we be has always been, we have always been, again and again and again, from time's beginning. But for centuries now, they've tried to keep us hidden. We worked our truth, twisted it in ways we found hard to refute, and rendered us mute and obscure. Told us we were diseased, sent us scurrying for a cure even though we were often sure that no treatment was needed. Had we in numbers heeded that intuition, would we have stood stronger against admonitions of societies who wished to closet us and succeeded? Until even we began to believe it, that who we be was unnatural and so hid ourselves and their truths about us spoken long enough and long enough became factual. And so we came to fear ourselves, hate ourselves, and only those brave enough to delve beyond the bull could reclaim it. It being the chronicles of us, rainbow colored brilliant beneath the lies and dust. Do you remember so-and-so's sister who loved so-and-so's mother? They went good together. Or so-and-so's aunt who was the beloved of so-and-so's auntie. That is our history also. Because who we are has always been. The rainbow descendants of rainbow ancestors Sometimes birthing, always claiming, often rainbow offspring. There is no thing unnatural about us except how you think and what you thought but should think no more. Because who we are, we have been before and will be forevermore. Despite death, despite the threat of death, despite the scorn, we were born into a tribe queered, misunderstood and so feared. But we have no agenda save one to rebuke the lies which have been spun and live the lives we've imagined, to tell our own stories with passion in order to refashion what the elders did not tell you. 
Wow. Thank you. Hey. My goodness. Um, there's applause rippling across the Caribbean right now. Uh, thank, I mean, you. thank you. Thank you so much for um, privileging us with that, that, that poem. And, you know, I think at least in my first question, because you are involved with so many aspects of performance, whether it's um, theater or performance on the page in terms of your writing. What, where did this come from? Is this something uh, that runs in your family, for instance? I'd actually like to think it, it does because, so I got actually this love of art from both my grandmother and my father actually, um, but also my family is known, I think. So when I went back and spoke with my grandmother, like she learned her love of, of art and culture from her grandmother. And then I think she passed it on to us. And on Sable, my grandmother is actually known uh, to be a cultural icon of sorts. She started a Sable Carnival. She started a young organization. I mean, an organization for young people called the Sable Girls and Boys Sports Society. And this actually, is Carmen, uh, Carmen this, Simmons. This is Carmen Simmons. So this Carmen is a good. I think uh, we have a, we have a photo yes, of Carmen actually. Exactly. I was going to say oh. this is a good uh, moment to bring that up. Um, and so, yes, um, yes. So there's my grandmother actually. Um, and this is when she was actually being honored for her years of service um, around Carnival. And then actually the next image is of her and myself uh, at our book launch. We had a collective book launch, which, which was a unique opportunity in and of itself because um, my book is actually about queer Caribbean topics and her book is about her history and involvement um, in culture and her growing up on Sable. And that's the commissioner of culture actually of Sable with us. But being able to do that, uh, that launch together actually meant that for the first time you had like a blended group together, really listening, you know, uh, to the both sides of the story, so to speak. But yes, going back to my grandmother, she really from young had us involved in plays and poetry, music, playing the piano. So I would like to think that I got my love of arts and culture in general from her. And actually, we still talk about um, a lot of top topics around arts and culture even now. And is your is your uh, were your parents as well um, also? I think your dad your dad is a Calypsonian. Well, yes, he actually sang in a uh, Calypso competitions uh, in the past on Sable, and so from him, I got my love of Calypso and of music. I think because he always played a lot of music at home and also a lot of Calypso. So Calypso, all right. So um, I'm yeah. from Trinidad, so you know, <laughs> immediately yeah. I've picked up. Uh, but tell us a little bit about the Calypso scene. I mean. I, what is it like in, in where you are? Well, um, I would say that, so the bulk of where I did Calypso um, was actually on St. Martin or where I was involved um, in Calypso was on St. Martin. And there was very much so a very male dominated, male centered uh, uh, space, you know? Um, and there were always women involved, uh, but maybe like one or two. Uh, that has changed, I would say in the last uh, couple of years, because you see a lot more of female presence uh, at the Calypso competitions. Um, but for me, entering Calypso was actually something that I did um, not so much for myself, but for my then um, ex-wife, or my now ex-wife, my then wife. Um, but she wanted to sing Calypso, and we actually went around trying to get some established writers to write for her. And uh, for one reason or the other, uh, they did not. They did not want to do so. And so I was sort of uh, forced to use skills I already had around poetry and around music uh, to develop uh, calypsos for her to sing. And the first year, actually, um, I, I penned one of my favorite songs. Uh, we didn't win, but um, I think she she did very well. She showed, uh, you know, a strong placement. And I think we certainly put the men on uh, on alert. And uh, the second year when we went in, it was sort of like the same thing, um, looking around to see people would write for her and they didn't. So then I wrote for her again. And uh, that year we won. And it was, it was, I think it was really good and really big and really sent a ripple um, you know, throughout the island. Oh my God, I mean, I mean that, that's such an incredible story of uh, using the resources at your disposal to, in the, in the end, make this huge statement because I think, can you tell us about the Calypso that she won with? Yes, yeah, so, um, the, well, first I'll tell you just about all of the Calypsos in, that I wrote because like each one of them are sort of uh, unique to me um, in that, I think being a artist on St. Martin and on Sable, a lot of people know that I am also lesbian. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm very unapologetic about it. So I often wrote um, those 
or aspects of that into the calypsos. So for the first calypso that I wrote for is called Crown Me Now. Um, and it was really just emphasizing the fact that St. Martin had never uh, crowned a female calypsonian or even really made it that a female could be a contender. Um, and so I really enjoyed uh, writing that one a lot. And then um, the ones that we won with was actually um, For the Love of St. Martin and None Better Than the Next. Um, and also in those uh, calypsos, you know, I think I, I painted a picture of, of uh, dynamics happening on the island in general, but also paid homage to the fact that here was two uh, queer women uh, contending for a very uh, male uh, dominant crown, you know, and, and being unapologetic uh, with the fact that we wanted it, I wanted it, um, and would do what we had to to get it. God, this is so romantic, actually. <laughs> <laughs> can we, uh, um, I don't know if the, can we have the lyrics for, the, for, that, um, for that Calypso? Um, I think we have some lyrics because I think yes. what I noticed about th that was that and not only was just the, the, the sheer fact of um, the ceiling being, the glass ceiling being broken, part of it, but the, the actual, you know, some of the lyrics in there were also mm -hmm. addressing being unashamed and being just open and visible, yeah. you know, out and yeah. about, you know. Um, so yeah. now I'm going to ask you to sing these two lyrics for uh, us. No, I'm not a singer. <laughs> I'm not a singer. Even though, I, I, even though I've competed in Road March, which is something different, I'm not a singer, but I will say, um, because we put up the two, and I will say, so the, the, the um, one that says from uh, Friendly Isles to Isles of Criminality, Murder and Crime Increased Brutality, this is our reality, but homosexuality is our immoral priority, and we're still waiting. So this one actually, you know, is a very powerful song, and people were actually uh, very amazed that um, I would write about it so openly and that she would sing about it so openly. And actually, the next set of lyrics um, would have been sung um, when she contended, or when she defended, rather, the crown. But by then, some dynamics had changed in our relationship, and also in, in where uh, she saw herself singing. And actually, uh, interestingly enough, this was a section that uh, she refused to sing. Um, and for me, as a writer, as a person who, who is sort of giving my, my uh, art to someone else, um, it was it was a, a eye opening experience, and um, actually it made me wish I could sing because I feel like lyrics like these are important for people to hear and and to really understand this uh, sort of um, confrontational aspect of art that you know that you can use art to pound home certain um, ideas that are worth sharing within communities, and so. Um, that's why I actually put the two up, or I, mm -hmm. I send it to end because one really, you know, uh, shows how at a moment um, it was it was brought into the community and it was discussed, and people people either liked it or didn't like it, but there's still a conversation had around it, and actually uh, how the second set of lyrics didn't actually get to have that same space. Yeah, because I know I noticed the shift. I'm not sure if people can read it, but. Uh, I, I think that um, you know the first set of lyrics they talk about how the hypocrisy of this you know this outrage over something right. as you know simple as love versus so many other pressing issues to deal with. I mean, and that is exactly. something I guess all of the Caribbean islands could probably um, mm -hmm. all of us in, in the islands could uh, empathize with. And then the second one though is more about you know you have a line, "My life's an open book," which is just also mirrors what you just said. You know, right, um, right. But it's amazing how even within this narrative of triumph, there's this yeah. uh, uh, but I will uh, complexity. Say, yes, but I will say, so I wrote these lyrics because when we won, there was a lot of pushback um, from some of the male Calypsonians and also mm -hmm. this idea that, um, you know, uh, these two uh, lesbian women had won this crown. Um, and so there was a lot of pushback. And actually, the following year, uh, one of the Calypsonians wrote a song um, called Prick. And uh, he made it seem like it was about an ice pick and that he was going to prick these two, uh, you know, female, uh, you know, Calypsonians and the Calypsoan writer. But actually it was merely, you know, it, it bordered on not necessarily uh, being kosher and cool. Um, a lot of people took offense with it. You know, I took more of the, the um, middle road in that Calypso uh, is actually supposed to be about the double entendre. And so, you, you, you know, you have to kind of be a little bit flexible about it. 
but I wrote these lyrics exactly to counter that in that, you know, even in this space of, of people or space of people saying um, negative things about our lives that, you know, we were going to be very unrepentant about um, the fact that we had done this uh, very big thing, which is win this crown um, as two women uh, living together, loving each other and not going to be ashamed about it. So then let's let's talk a little bit more about that, because I mean, that uh, again, it points to just the power of culture and the power of music to shift and change attitudes, mm -hmm. as well as to reflect um, the challenges you know, and the homophobia. I mean, that is, I mean, undoubtedly a calypso like that, you know, is something that would incite or encourage people to be violent, for instance. So I wonder then, you know, working within this space, do you have any views in particular on just how important things that a lot of people may take for granted, like a simple soca song or calypso song or whatever dancehall song? Do, do you have any views on how powerful that can be, not only for members of the LGBTQ community, but also across the board uh, in terms of, you know, progress and shaping attitudes? Well, I definitely think culture, I mean, I definitely think culture and arts and music and, and poetry, you know, all of these things combined, they're very powerful. And so they can be used um, against the LGBT community, but they can also be used by the LGBT community. And I think because I've been so involved in um, culture and art that I've, I've taken the stance that we should also, as much as we can, use it to put our message out there, um, to put our message, to, so to counter the, the, the violence with information, with, with um, education, so that people can get to see that some of the misconceptions that they have um, are actually, you know, not true and that they can engage in conversations. And the only way to engage in conversations is to put things out there. Um, and so for me, that's why I use part of my art and part of my work to continuously do that. I, I use activism for that as well, but I also incorporate it into my art because I think, um, and Clara Reyes, who is a well-known, you know, um, artist and choreographer on St. Martin, she always says, you know, Lisanne, arts can be transformative. Um, and you have to use it as such. And so from, from the time I heard that, it resonated. And for me, like as much as possible, I'm, whenever I'm doing um, poems, for example, I don't shy away from um, doing poems. If, if someone says, can you come and do a poem about love? I don't shy away about reading a love poem to women. I love women, right? Um, and so for me, I think it's also about us where and when we can taking space and, and, and creating new narratives and, and getting people to understand um, that our love is also um, a very natural thing. And so for the book launches that I actually had around here, a lot of times people told me, they were like, listen, I'm a straight person, but when I read your poems, I can identify with the love or with the loss or with the longing that you had in that moment. And so for me, I'm like, there you go. Art can make connections that you may not have been able to make otherwise um, in other conversations. Definitely. And um, I'm just going to take the opportunity now uh, for anybody who's only now joining us. I'm Andre Bagu, and I'm talking to Lisanne Golasai Charles. Um, and if you have any questions, remember to please put them in the comments section below. You know, um, so just continuing that, that train of thought, I mean, yeah, definitely. We've had a lot of issues, particularly in our region, with, you know, figures um, like Buju Banton and stuff. And mm -hmm. this question of, of the role that is or is not played, the appropriate, um, do we do we take ownership of uh, of those moments when these pejorative things are uh, put out there? Um, and you just mentioned um, Clara Reyes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? You are involved in theater. Well, with um, I'm involved in theater primarily through and with Clara. Um, so. Uh, I first met her when she heard me reading a poem um, uh, about mother-daughter relationships. And she came to me, she said, listen, I want to work with you. And since then, we've, you know, cre we've had moments where we've shared a space around uh, creation in, in theater. And so I was in one of her plays called uh, In the Company of Women. And then uh, together we co-produced a, a, a production called uh, The Vagina Monologue St. Martin, or In the Company of Women, The Vagina Monologue St. Martin 
which was, uh, you know, it was a show that touched on a lot of taboos for St. Martin. Um, it had like a first scene between two women, uh, sort of a, a erotic scene. We also had a dominatrix scene. Um, there were scenes where about people exploring how they could come into contact with each other and have safe sex. So it was, it was really um, a very, you know, bold statement and bold show. And then the last show that we did together was actually a show called Don't Be Afraid of Rainbows. And the whole process around that was one that, you know, I trusted Clara with and she really uh, took it in, in, in her own uh, way because she never just says like, okay, I'm gonna write a script and come and give it to people. She really brings people in, uh, hears their stories, incorporates their stories into the show. And that is ultimately what happened. So we had all of these people from the LGBT community come in. Uh, we had like three sessions, I think, to begin where people were just sharing uh, the good parts of their lives with LGBT people, the bad parts, the really hurtful, harmful parts and things that they had gone through. And we created this beautiful show called Don't Be Afraid of Rainbows. And uh, we put it on and uh, we invited people from government to come, uh, people from the different uh, community organizations to come out. We had a packed house. And afterwards, like people really came up to us and said like, we didn't know that on St. Martin, parents put their children out of their homes. You know, we didn't know that, um, you know, we didn't know that children were still so afraid to be themselves on St. Martin, they were afraid to go to school, that, that churches would sometimes perform um, conversion therapy on children on St. Martin. And so like, we really used that production to um, give voice to people who sometimes have no voice, even within a tolerant society such as St. Martin. And I, I think we actually have some images of that that yes, production. Yes, um, we do. I was actually, I was kind of curious. Actually, as you mentioned, parents. Uh, did your, uh, what are your parents? Um, did your parents ever come to any of these productions? Yes, my mother was there. My, I have to say, you know, I think my my family is quite supportive of me, of my art, of my life in general. Um, so my mother was at this show. She was very proud. Um, you know, um, also of, of the various moments that my story came out because I also shared, you know, my story of growing up a small a, a Catholic, um, unstable, very small community, conservative community in that vein. Um, and so she was very proud of the fact that, you know, I was able to share that, but also able to show the resilience and the development um, of, of myself over time. So, yeah, so on the picture, yeah, I just want to say this is various members of the cast um, and sharing their story. And we use song, poetry, dance, um, theater. We use all of it, you know, uh, together to make like a powerful one hour and 15 minute production that we put on. And it's interesting because that theatricality, uh, it comes right back to, for instance, uh, the Calypso and even the writing. Um, the, po the poetry, spoken word, or even on the page, you know, it has that kind of aura of bearing a, a costume or just giving, speaking truth, I guess, to power. And I was just mm -hmm. intrigued by, I mean, you've mentioned, um, you know, your family and your your dad uh, is also Calypsonian. And, well, uh, he, was, you, he was. He was, he was. Yeah. But um, you mentioned uh, previously, I think, that you have some ties to some of Trinidad's um, Calypso greats in terms of who came, who, who, who was there in your household? Oh, yeah. So well, that's from my grandmother again, because my grandmother was very involved with carnival and whatnot. So um, I grew up with all of these different people in and out of her house because they would stay in the guest room. So Sparrow was here and he stayed with us. Tigress was here. I love Tigress. Singing Sandra was here and she uh, stayed with my grandmother, came, had uh, dinner. Um, so, you know, all of these people uh, would be in and out and, and I was always very intrigued with them. I, up to this day, I remember like when Tigress came, she was like larger than life. Um, and I was so in awe of her, you know, and I was thinking like, oh, I, I, I want to do whatever she does, I want to do it. Um, so yeah, again, you know, um, my grandmother really gave me a space and, and, you know, introduction to arts and to these various people. And she's also been, very supportive or as supportive as she can be for someone um in her age group and being catholic as well so then i mean given this lineage lineage um you do spoken word you're in the theater mm -hmm. calypso next 
performance, perhaps? No, because, you know, I've, I've really been trying to, to figure out how to control my voice. Um, with Road March, you don't have to do it as much because it's more jump and wave and, and you know, um, that kind of stuff. So I've, I've dabbled in Road March, and, and if people, uh, you know, look on YouTube very well, they, they can find it. Um, but I think, for me, I prefer to continue writing Calypsos because I think there's also a space there for writers um, to make impact and, and really have... Uh, someone with a stronger voice uh, sing the calypsos for me. Um, so no, I don't anticipate going onto the stage, but I definitely anticipate continuing to be uh, active and engaged with calypso for sure, and hopefully being able to pass that on and help pass that on to, to future generations. It's interesting as well. Um, I mean, writing uh, is definitely uh, fundamental. And I mean, you're very much concerned as a poet with LGBTQ literature throughout the region. I mean, you are, mm -hmm. in addition to your publishing ventures, I mean, you've had some, for you, there are some books that have been, that, that have meant, meant a lot to you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk, us, talk to us about a few of them? Sure, so I will pick um, three that really stood out to me because they're, they, 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 they helped me when I was still struggling, I think, to, to figure out myself and also to figure out how to put um, what I was thinking in regards to that on paper. So the first book is Zami, which is from Audrey Lord, and I think like you know everyone should read it. Um, another book is called Tongues on Fire, and it's actually uh, so it's actually stories that um, a lady collected from across the Caribbean region of women who love women um, and how how it was in their communities. And that book in particular, I will say that book in particular helped me to feel less alone on my journey. Because when you realize um, how similar the journeys are across the Caribbean, um, you know, in terms of engaging with family, engaging with the community that you're in, engaging with the church, et cetera, um, it really made me see that there are many more people like me out there. Um, and the last one I will uh, mention is called um, Our People. It's by Thomas Glaive. And it's a, a collection from across the Caribbean as well um, of LGBT stories, poetry, pictures, and it also just again like just gave me a sense of of queer Caribbeanness, you know, and not that is that is not um, some anomaly or some some import because oftentimes in activism um, I hear that a lot, like you know, like this is this is something that's brought in to the Caribbean from somewhere else, and, and it, this is not Caribbean, and and actually like we've always been here, you know, and and we've always been engaged with art, we've always been engaged with with everyday aspects of life. So for me, it's important just that, you know, that that information is out there and that people can, um, you know, have it and, and see themselves in writing. I think, yeah, I mean, we've had some, uh, before this conversation, we've had some exchanges and you've had, mm -hmm. uh, you've actually sent me a list of yes. like dozens of books um, yes. I think we would most likely share with everyone later, perhaps yes. on the um, Catapult social media pages or maybe beneath this video, we'll post it at some stage, we'll figure it out. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, so it is an integral part of this whole notion um, of that intersection between culture and activism, because yes. you're right, part of it is, you know, there's this, um, what's this animus against this idea of, um, anyone speaking up and speaking out and being overly political and then that is denigrated as something that is imported or foreign. But the list of books of writers who live here and now within the region um, mm -hmm. alone kind of shows the lie of that type of... Yeah. That, that type of or who are, who are living abroad but are a part of the diaspora, you know? Like, like people are creating it. And I think that library is kind of growing more and more, you know, as people become more empowered in the region. And, and write then about our lives because in, in very unrepentant ways, you know, um, because it, it's as if every it, it's as if someone else is just writing any other story, you know. So why why hide it? Why um, try to sugarcoat it? Why romanticize it? No, like LGBT lives are just regular lives, like you know the trials, the triumphs, the ups, the downs. So I think like as more and more people begin to come into this and. And, and, you know, don't feel necessarily defensive or that you have to write about it only in one particular way because otherwise people say, well, oh, there you go, you see, there's something indeed wrong with them. But you just say, like, listen, it's, it's a 
regular life, like any other person would have a life. Um, you're getting more and more stories and rich stories um, that people can find themselves in. So then um, tell us about that. Tell us about your own um, efforts to collect some of these stories. I think you have some projects in which you're looking to do yes. that. Yeah, so I have a project that's coming up, actually. Um, it's called We Dance Dance Hall. And it's actually going to be a collection of uh, stories, essays, paintings, whatever artists or LGBT artists from around the Caribbean want to contribute uh, to this collection, um, which will talk about how we engage with dance hall. And why I, choose to, why I chose to start with dance hall to begin with is indeed because of the hostilities felt, uh, you know, by LGBT people in this particular genre. You know, people, people sometimes say like, oh, but you're singling out dance hall, but Calypso is also quite homophobic. And you know, there are other, um, there are other uh, genres that are also quite homophobic indeed. But I think in the manner in which uh, dance hall have sort of put a lot of their, 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 their stuff out there um, mm -hmm. has had impact and very real impact on the LGBT community of the Caribbean. Um, I know you mentioned earlier about Buju, and so like uh, for me that was also a very interesting, um, uh, you know, uh, moment to kind of go through when he was being released because I'm definitely a fan of Buju Banton's music, other than um, one or two songs that are you know quite um, homophobic. But it was it was a struggle about what to feel, and 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 um, for me, I felt very good when he finally came out and said something, like said, like, look, I've moved on from this moment. Um, I do not subscribe to the things that I said then. Um, I was, I was, it, it sort of lifted a burden off of my shoulder because a lot of people were also looking to the organization I'm, I'm busy with on St. Martin's and like, okay, well, what are you guys feeling and what do you think, and, you know? Um, and it was interesting looking at LGBT activists across the region. Um, talk about this moment, but also from different angles. So there were people who were saying like, listen, um, Buju has done a lot to talk uh, for uh, black, uh, black realities, for uh, poor realities. Um, so I'm not going to just uh, push him aside because he made a song or two that spoke uh, against the LGBT community. Whereas there were also other LGBT activists who were saying like, listen, absolutely not. Um, this song has done so much damage to the community, we cannot. You know, um, you cannot just, you know, be cheering him on the fact that he's, he's been released and, you know, who knows what he's going to uh, say next or we're not going to support him when he comes to country. Um, so there were those conversations happening. And for me, it was very interesting to also sit back and, and observe them and, and, and see how they resonated with me um, as they were happening, you know, on social media primarily. Because I also felt sort of in the middle, um, you know, there, like saying, indeed, because I'm not, you know, one dimensional. So, yes. I am lesbian, but I'm also black. I'm also, you know, I come from a background um, of, of people unstable who work very, very hard so that the next generation could be um, up out of poverty. Um, so for me, it was also okay. Where, where do I, um, where do I fit into this whole conversation? Um, and so that's why it really prompted me to go back to a, a old um, project that I had had from ten years ago in the Netherlands. Of, thinking about dance hall and how LGBT people relate to dance hall. Because I remember yeah, going because to there, there was this, um, I'm sorry, I just remember. No, no, this like, um, you know, like you talk about that, those antinomies of, you know, either like oh, against it or, um, you know, mm -hmm. for it or what. And then there's this, um, there's this third, third way, this third position where, particularly now, I think I've heard a lot of um, people talk about this idea of uh, taking ownership or, claiming it, you know, and I, yeah, I participated yeah. a few years ago in a conference called Beyond Homophobia in Jamaica. And um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in fact, there's a whole publication about that that's just come out yeah. from UE Press. And, um, and I think one of the talking points is always, well, there's always, there are always some people who are like, we'll play, the, we'll play this song that has this lyric in a gay party and we will like yeah. take ownership of it and then some people are like no it's still too triggering yeah. um you know and so yeah so there are lots of nuances in there yeah, but exactly. i guess the, the importance is i guess just realizing what that it is an issue at all because equally mm -hmm. i have found that there are some people who just um you know it's hard to empathize with another perspective and to think well how would I feel if I'm just in a space yeah. and suddenly this starts to play and 
do you feel safe you know and mm -hmm. just you know crossing that bridge is is what is so hard and i think that's why it's so important this project that you're talking about now yes. you know, in which you know um you're gathering stories so how will people yes. be able to participate in this yes so um a little later on there's going to be a card up or a picture up about how to contact me and they can send their uh submissions to either of the of the two email addresses that um uh, will be up there but also you know it's still a project really in development so i spoke with uh, one or two organizations that i'm busy with uh, developing it and we're going to put out an open call as well um in a few weeks uh and then people will also have the, the email accounts to uh, send it to but um indeed they will be able to send it to one of the two that will come up later and for me i think i just want it to be really um a space in which people can engage with the conversation and so that it doesn't have to be uh, so much tension because I remember being indeed in Jamaica um, last year at the Caribbean Women and Sexual Diversity Conference and we went to a panel discussion about this and there, there was like two, two very polarized groups like saying like listen um, we don't understand one saying we don't understand why you're picking on dance hall clips was also very homophobic um, the other group saying like you know um, no this is ridiculous people you know real people's lives are at stake here why would you support this why would you support these artists and I think having a space in which to, to hear real stories and how people really just think about it and, and rationalize um, their relationship with this very uh, dominant, you know, music genre, musical genre in the Caribbean will be something enlightening and add to uh, the, the collection of, of queer stories out there. Oh, wonderful. And um, I think now would be a great moment for you to read your second poem. Okay, sure. So the second poem is the one that I actually started reading uh, earlier in my nerves. Um, and it's called, I Want to Tell You. And it's actually from the um, production, Don't Be Afraid of Rainbows. So um, one of the things that I felt like, you know, um, when I heard the stories of the people in the room, um, a lot of times it was about this process that they had to go through um, from initial inklings about who they were and sort of terror about that to kind of growing bit by bit to accept it for themselves and then you know share it with other people and all of the different challenges um, that came with that. So I wanted to, to go back to that initial moment though, that initial terror and, and talk to um, them and to other people who would be listening. So it's called, I want to tell you. I want to tell you, I want to tell you that you should not be afraid of rainbows, that they are symbols of both beauty and grace, that they carry the covenants of sustenance if you dare to follow them. And at the end, there are pots of gold enough to pave your own precious streets. I want to tell you, I want to tell you that you should not be scared of rainbows, that they are sacred even unto us, that the fires of hell cannot burn as intensely as the disgust you harbor for yourself because you do not trust that you are imperfectly perfect just the way you are. I want to tell you, I want to tell you that somewhere in the center of rainbows, there is God, glorious as you've ever known God to be, reminding you that things do get better, that your ideas of yourself do get clearer, that your inner voice that you've been programmed to hear does get dimmer. If you decide to redefine for yourself what is sin, sinning or sinner if you figure that you are worth weathering storms to reach that we are each god loved in our own right i want to tell you i want to tell you that rainbows are not scary that they carry with them the promise of rebirth redemption resolve and revolution extraction from the delusion that something is wrong with you the confusion that who you are is caused by nature gone as you that you are an aberration, abnormal, unnatural, when all that is factual points out another truth, that you are more simply you, rainbow proud, beautiful, growing you, one of a kind, radiant you. I want to tell you, I want to tell you that rainbows are ours, that there is so much more to this world than what you know, and that if you are open and willing to go, then rainbows can be bridges too taking you over abysses that you think you will that you think will destroy you over chasms you think would consume you but if you are brave enough to brave them and go then you will blow your own mind with brilliance 
because you will have learned to be resilient and rely mainly, chiefly, principally on you. I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I want to tell you. Ah, Thank you. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Oh, I think this is, the, this is the perfect moment to open the floor up now to questions. Um, I don't know if there, there are any questions actually. And, So Annalie, hello Annalie. Annalie is saying, um, I believe Saban speak Dutch and English and maybe um, a lot other language and Spanish. Do you write in English exclusively? And if not, how does being multi multilingual affect your process of creative writing? Hmm. Okay, so indeed Saban speak uh, English primarily in Dutch as well. Um, and some Sabans do speak Papiamento because actually um, the Netherlands Antilles or the former Netherlands Antilles had a lot of movement uh, between the islands. Um, and there is a large Spanish uh, population on Sabans right now. Um, I speak uh, English and some Dutch, I like to say, um, and a tiny little bit of Papiamento. But I, I enjoy sort of um, playing with language. Um, and usually when I'm writing poems about the relationship between the kingdom or between the Netherlands um, and the islands of the kingdom, then I tend to play with Dutch a little bit because it, it adds a certain tension to some poems. Um, but primarily I do write in English and, and I've written a love poem or two in Papiamento. Um, and that is a process in and of itself because you know it's not my um, mother tongue. So I have to think about it, think about which words make sense. Um, but indeed, I, I for now, I, I've, primarily write in English. I would love to learn French Creole, um, not French Creole, Creole, because I've every time I hear, I've heard people read in it, and I think like, oh my God, it's so um, musical, you know? Um, unlike sometimes I feel um, English or Dutch, which I've also tried to write a poem or two in. Um, but yes, so my process is really strictly in English. Um, that's where I feel most fluent, most comfortable, most able to ex express myself. Um, and again, like when I, I want to put some anger in a poem uh, concerning the kingdom, then I, I bring out some Dutch um, because I think it's, it's important to also incorporate that uh, in there. Yeah, there's a bit, lots of fricatives in that language. <laughs> and, uh, yes, for sure, for sure. But, you know, this actually points to a nuance um, that I think is only possible in poetry versus, because I'm, I, you know, questioning you about well, why Calypso versus poetry versus, you know, the Richard word versus the, and all of those nuances that you just spoke about, I, it strikes me that would only be possible on, like, in the written kind of text. You would only appreciate that in a, in a different kind of forum as opposed to where you, you have this very direct engagement with Calypso, um, mm -hmm. you know, because, like, in the poem you just read, um, whenever you said, I want to tell you, I mean, I've been lucky to read this poem. It's actually written as E-Y-E, not, not, yes. not just the I. And I don't know if you could tell yeah. me a little bit more about that choice. Yeah, so I will say that, you know, and even editing this book, it was, it was very uh, difficult for me because I do, again, like to play with words and, and um, bust up words, you know, tear them apart, put them, put them in brackets, uh, same with the title here. Um, but so this, this I, uh, E-Y-E, I, I use it as I, I, and I. And I actually started using it about 10 years ago to talk um, one, to, to, to sort of be a contrast between the I and I of, of uh, Rastafarianism. Um, and two, to speak to sort of like the three levels of consciousness that I feel that I have within myself. So the higher I, the third I, um, the consciousness, the, the human I, and sort of like, you know, my lower ego-driven I, uh, which is the, the common I. Um, so, in that poem, um, when it's read, you can, you can see it differently than if I'm just saying it. And so I remember that the lady who was editing uh, the book for me, she was saying like, you know, she was like, this is giving me a lot of headaches because she's like, you use it in the poem, but um, uh, you know, maybe people won't get what you're saying. So then actually in the book, we had to go back and put a whole lot of footnotes to explain what certain, um, certain words or terms meant. Um, and for me, I think it's important to do that as an artist, to play with language, um, mm -hmm. to, to be able to read it one way, for me to read it to, to the audience one way, but for them to also be able to read it 
um, for themselves in a different way, to, to, mm. to connect with it in a different way. And I think so, because before as well, like, you know, people would always question me about it, like, like why do you spell happiness with a Y instead of an I? Um, you know, all of these kind of things. And um, for me, it was like simply saying, like, listen, in whatever way that you can, um, claim space, shake things up. You don't have to fit into a particular box. Your words don't have to fit into a particular box. Um, yes, and so that's why I continue to engage with words and, and written word in particular in that manner. And it's incredible. That's it's almost like a querying of language, um, but of course, that's yeah. just what all poets do, anyhow. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, and you you mentioned editing the book. Um, tell us a little bit more about your first ever. How did you start actually publishing? Because I also understand that you have started your own little publishing venture. Yes. So um, the first book that I started uh, with was actually my grandmother's book because my grandmother fell quite ill a few years ago. And, and I really felt that her story was one that was needed um, to be heard on Sable because she came from a very uh, you know, uh, disruptive childhood and sort of still did all of these things and contributed in all these different ways to her island. And so I sort of put pressure on her to do it. And then she's like, okay, but how are we gonna get it published? How are we gonna and so I had to start investigating for myself, like how to get it out there in the quickest way possible, um, in the most cost efficient way possible. And doing all of those steps for her book then led me to realize that, hey, I can do it for myself. And uh, from there, I started uh, Zami Zami Press, which is very small and I'm still figuring out a whole lot of details, but um, that's where I, I published here through and where I'm gonna publish my second book. And eventually I hope to bring in other projects as well and I'll publish more queer Caribbean uh, literature through this organization. And I saw that we had a question, so I don't know if um, we can uh, go back to it before it gets lost. Yeah, I mean, that's a wonderful story of how your you know, publishing basically began as a kind of a love tribute to your grandmother. Yes, so, uh, yes. Have you had the chance to travel and perform across the region or attend literary festivals? Also, could you speak a bit about the process of self-publishing in the Caribbean? Yes. So um, I have had a chance to travel. I've traveled to Tortola. I've traveled to Curacao uh, to perform. And I've traveled, of course, I was on St. Martin because I live there. Um, so those are, that's the, the bulk. And I'm in, at all of them, I've, I've been well received, I would say. Um, I think because indeed my, my poem or at least one, uh, because I do write about other things also, um, but at least one I would always put in there to kind of uh, let people know that I'm, I'm very, you know, much um, busy with this as a topic. Um, so it's been received well in some places and other places you can see that uh, the audiences were a little bit standoffish about that one particular poem or so. Um, but I definitely look forward to traveling to many more uh, festivals post COVID of, I've done virtual festivals, so I, could take, I will continue to do those. Um, and the process of self-publishing, I would say it, it can be difficult, like it can be difficult in particular um, sourcing funding, um, especially for the Dutch Caribbean, I've, I've realized. Uh, we have one or two places where we can get funding um, and the, 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 the bar is quite high to get it, I think, I think, um, but the process is, is also sometimes very solitary because you have to you know, figure out a lot of things on your own. And for me, it would be great if actually there can be connections between people who have done it and, and you know, figuring out how to get uh, editors who will be able to look at your stuff. I think I've been very blessed that I've had people willing to step in and say, listen, we believe in this project and so we're gonna uh, donate some of our time or um, you know, give you certain things uh, at a reduced cost. So that also made it quite possible for my grandmother's book and um, my book, um, but I would say that, you know, a lot of the stuff I had to figure out on my own online um, and just going through the processes. So um, I'm always open if people want, you know, more in-depth information about what I've had to do. I actually published uh, my grandmother's book through a small company in Tennessee first and then later through Amazon and my own book through Amazon. Um, I'm still looking to see what other uh, prospects and possibilities there are, and it's an ongoing uh, journey. Tell us, uh, you mentioned a moment ago about, you know, in your different travels, just pinging off that question, um, you know, sometimes when you read a poem, the reaction is different. 
I mean, how mm -hmm. how must it feel to to go out there and be? It takes a certain bravery, anyhow, to be an artist and present your work. Um, but to then to present something as personal as this, and for the reaction to not quite be mm. what you would hope, how does that make you feel? Um, it makes me feel sad, but it also just you know reiterates the fact that we have work to do. Um, and so for me, I always take it from that standpoint. And of course, you know, like it does take bravery, and and from for me, even like sometimes I see myself right before I have to say a certain word, like, you know, or when I have to say the female pronoun, um, like sometimes I would see myself seizing up because I know it may not be um, received well, but I, but I also push myself through that wall because I know that I can do it and there are many more who may not be able to do it. Um, and because sometimes I'm, I'm coming to certain spaces and have a certain safety because I'm an outsider that people who maybe are insiders don't have, um, I feel compelled to do it because I want to leave something better behind for, you know, for, for the younger generation. Because my own story, I mean, even though I, I have the support of my family, it was still quite um, painful, you know, uh, going through, through the whole 10 year coming out process. So. Um, for me, I, if I can scrap that for just one or two or three, or four, I, I feel like I've, I've, it's worth it to be uncomfortable, for me to be uncomfortable. So then what was that process like for you? I mean, you're obviously very close to your family and things are mm -hmm. fine now, but you, it seems as though maybe that's not how it began. Um, uh, so how it began is because like Seva in general is a community where, you know, don't ask, don't tell, just, you know, but I'm a teller. So I told my mother, I said, you know, and I told my grandmother as well, I said, you know, I think I'm, I think I like women. And so my grandmother and my mother were both like, at 15, every, everybody likes each other. Don't worry about that. Just pray to God, it's gonna, it's gonna go away. Um, and I was also raised sort of by this very um, uh, religious community from Trinidad, actually. So I was raised by them when my father passed away. Um, and so there was this certain amount of pressure, I think, from, you know, that I had internalized that I just could not be um, gay. And so I really struggled with that for 10 years, like figuring out from, from 25, I mean, 15 to 24, like really saying like, I don't want this, this is not me, you know, and, and just because I also didn't want to disappoint my family, I didn't want to disappoint these people who had you know, invested so much time and energy and, and, and you know, assisting my family and helping out with us. But in the end, I also realized that I had to be true to myself and I couldn't continue to, you know, uh, self-harm in order to uh, make other people comfortable. I had to really, like, live my truth, write my truth, um, tell my truth and, and just live. And, and once I think, once I did that, my family very quickly came around to just be like, okay, this is the season and this is the year. Yeah. yeah, and I think given all that's happening these days, um, the importance of that is all the more urgent in a sense. Um, yeah, I think we have exactly. another, yeah, I mean, how are you feeling actually about, you know, that? Like, I don't know, if, I don't know if you're following the election results. Or... I am, I am, and I'm, I'm, my fingers are very much crossed because I just feel like, you know, there was so much progress made um, in the previous years that, th that this pushback, that this pushback, I think, uh, it took us by surprise, but it was it was um, coming, you know. But I don't think we can take another four years of it. And and because I think sometimes the the U.S. sets the tone, whether they should or shouldn't, sets the tone for how a lot of um, things are viewed across the Caribbean region, but also you know uh, the rise of the right in, in Europe and all that kind of stuff. I think like if if that is cut short now, that will be much better for everybody than uh, another four years of the pushback. Yeah, do you think then that, you know, it, it, where perhaps politicians might fail, we may have to re resort to depending more on artists? Yeah, yeah, but, but I do think that art has really helped to, to make this change and, and not just, you know, not just for, for LGBT um, equality, but also for women's rights, also for, you know, uh, rights for black people, um, you know, and for other minorities. I think arts give people a space to engage with material in a way and to also process it and internalize it in a way that they wouldn't be able to do so otherwise. 
Like I saw, I remember at Don't Be Afraid of Rainbow, like I saw like politicians who had sort of been very, you know, like resolute about, you know, St. Martin being a Christian society and so things had to be done this way, like with tears in their eyes because they really uh, heard the story firsthand from somebody who had been through something quite terrible about something that they couldn't even do anything about being gay. Yeah. 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 Gosh. So yeah. So lots of work to do. Um, yeah. So lots I, of work to do. I think we had another question. Um, yes. If you could choose three other artists that could could um, could have been outspoken like Buju to deliver the right message, who would they be? Oh well, yes, I, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I would say right off the bat, Calypso Rose has oh, done yes. her part in the last years and, in, in, mm. uh, you know, advocating for the community and being, you know, very outspoken about her life and how she lives her life. And I actually had the privilege to meet her uh, in 2016 and she was awesome. Um, I also think uh, not in music, but in poetry, Stacey Ann Chin has done so much work. Um, you know, she's been in New York now, but she's done so much work. I think bringing light to Caribbean realities that I would have to choose her. And then uh, who else? I'm, I'm, I have to really think. Um, I know that there's been in, in recent times, like, you know, some Calypso artists, I mean, some Soka artists who have been also very outspoken for the LGBT community and very supportive of the uh, LGBT community. So I would just pick those people in, 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 in a group and say like, you know, continue to speak up for us and speak out for us. Um, uh, for example, Marcel has said like, you know, please just let people live their lives, Nadia Batson as well, um, and you know, some others. So I would just, you know, ask them to continue to speak up and out for us. Yeah, and that dovetails quite nicely because um, it's not just members of the LGBTQ community, it's allies, it's people just rep mm -hmm. like recognizing the responsibility and the power that they have. Exactly. The platforms that they have, be it in yeah. their soakers or just in their positions. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we could probably go on, but um, we're going to have to wrap up now. Uh, it has been such a pleasure to talk with you. I'm so excited uh, to hear about all your projects, and I hope everyone um contact suzanne um uh in that regard uh just a little bit of housekeeping um i will be back around four o'clock uh this afternoon uh to talk with the puerto rican writer beatrice janine figuera um and uh that's another conversation that i'm looking forward to so in closing today's sal t today's summer i'd like to express once more huge thanks to the catapult partners including the american friends of jamaica kingston creative Fresh Milk, uh, and everyone else who's worked to make this salon happen. Now remember, I won the election according to the legal votes. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.